In the midst of North County San Diego is beautiful San Marcos. Let's check it out. Welcome to San Marcos, California. Whether you're here or in San Diego, Sacramento, or San Antonio, Texas, we're so honored to have you a part of our community. We want to give a quick shout out to John and Julie in Vicenza, Italy. Vicenza, Italy, isn't that crazy? They're joining us on a regular weekly basis. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. Well, my name is Trent Jenkins. I'm our online community pastor. We have a few, few important things that we want to tell you about, but we also want to let you know we're going to be having a special time of prayer before our message begins just for Israel and everything that is taking place in that part of the world. Before that, we want to let you know about our men's conference. It's going to be taking place in just a few weeks. We would love for you to be able to participate with us on campus at the Vista campus. If you here live in the San Diego area or if you're part of our online community, you can join us there as we will be streaming this event. To get more information, simply go to our website and click on the men's conference banner and you can get all the important details there. We want to let you know though, Chris Brown's going to be speaking, Ricky Jenkins is going to be speaking, and we have a host of different activities that are going to be taking place on site on Friday night. So make sure that you are getting registered for this incredible event. Sacramento community, we have a special service that's going to be coming up on November 5th. So if you are in the area, we would love for you to be able to come. Simply go to our website and go backslash Sacramento for more information about that service on November 5th. And then lastly, uh, our hearts have been breaking as we've been seeing so many news reports coming in of all the atrocities that have taken place there in Israel. And we want to be able to stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters in prayer and solidarity and for the peace of God to be able to come upon that land. So would you join with me right now in prayer as we get ready for the rest of this service. And I wanna let you know, you can download our message notes on our website, you can give online, you can put in your additional prayer requests by simply texting them into this phone number on your screen, or you can always put them in through your connection card. Let's go ahead and pray and then dive into worship. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we can be unified through prayer, regardless of where we're at in this world. And God, we pray for your hand of protection over that entire region for those men and women and families that are living in fear, living in bomb shelters because of rockets going over their heads. God, I pray that your peace, Lord, your spirit would descend upon those people, Lord, in that region in such a mighty way. Lord, we pray that peace would ultimately land in this region, Lord, that this conflict would cease, that the loss of life would cease. Lord, we pray for every single one of those hostages that they would be returned to their family, that no harm would be brought upon them God, we pray for the world leaders, Lord, that the right people would come to the surface and to be able to help bring about peace. And Lord, we pray for the protection of Israel in this entire region. Lord, many people would love to wipe this entire race and this entire religion off the map. And God, we pray that your sovereign hand would be a hand of protection over them, this land, and this faith. Lord, we thank you. Be with them. Be with us as we continue in our service. Lord, thank you for the message that's going to be heard today in your name. Amen.
I just don't want this prayer to end. I, I know as soon as there's an amen, it, it's all over and I'm not even sure what's coming next. I just want to linger in this moment. I don't know if you felt that. I don't know if you know what's been coming to this conclusion and, and you just want to huddle together a little while longer. I know I do. I know I do. I know these last, what, 10 weeks, whatever it's been through four chapters in the upper room. I just want to stay there. I've gotten so much out of this. I know the church has got so much momentum behind these famous last words. And yet Jesus knows that little internal clock on the wall is just ticking down. He knows he's got to finish his prayer. He knows he has to leave a crowded city and get to a quiet place where the guards can take him. This is the last night of Jesus's freedom. This is the last night with his disciples, the very last supper. And what's come out in these last, I don't know what it's taken in real time, 15, 20, 25 minutes at the most. What's come out on this table, everything they need to know about following God in Christianity has hit me personally. I know it's hit you as well. And I just want to stay here. I, I don't want to rush into the next chapters. I just want to linger here. It's like, a, it's like the last day of vacation that's been so good and you didn't realize how much you needed it until you got there and yet you know you should start packing because you got to leave the next day and you don't even want to think about it you don't want it to end or or the christmas morning where everyone is gathered and there's no drama and you know pretty soon people will be packing cars and people have to get back to a crazy busy life but you just you just wish you could stay there in that moment that hug of a son or daughter at the door their car is packed and you know the moment they drive away and start school It'll be a while. This house is going to be different. Things aren't going to go back to normal. And, and you just want those moments to last. Church, I'm going to tell you, I just want to stay in this upper room. I find what Jesus is teaching. I find his encouragement to us. I find his passion for the type of life we're supposed to live and for people that don't know him yet. I find in this upper room around this table at this last supper, so much encouragement, so much challenge in his words. And now I listen to him closing his prayer and I don't want it to end. <laughs> and, and yet maybe that's the point. He does. He knows, look, it's one thing to gather around my word and my teaching and to hear what my heart is on this, but it's time for you to do something with it. Jesus has got his mission. The disciples have got theirs. We have ours. It's time to leave the upper room. We're in the very final words of Jesus. 
that last night. If you're just joining us, I just want to unpack the upper room just kind of in, in one full swoop so we understand what happened that night when they all got up in that second floor room inside the walls of Jerusalem. From the moment Jesus sits down, he's got an agenda. He has a mission. It's his famous last words to his followers then. I think it's what's most important to us today. And right off the start, he shocks the entire room. You can take your own notes however you want to in this, bla in this blank of unpacking the upper room. But, but right off the bat, we have simply Jesus washing feet. Jesus washing feet. In a room of 12, he makes himself number 13. In a room where the disciples all could have picked up the foot washing material and served each other, but they refused to, Jesus does it. And the room is silent electricity is in the air as he goes from from one person's feet to another to another and finally when he gets to peter peter breaks the silence the shock in the room they can't understand how the son of god has lowered himself to one of the lowest levels in culture how the son of god has literally taken the position of the crap slave the slave that has to wash the animal dung from between your toes and around your feet the caked and baked roads of all the emissions of the animals of that day it's why you walk with, with open-toed shoes, and yet it's why you have to have your feet clean before you go in, and the evening meal has already been served, and Jesus says, I'm going to serve you at this level. And the room is absolutely blown away by the one with all the title, the position, the authority. You're serving us like that? And Jesus says, man, if you're shocked by that, you're going to get this next one. And he points out Judas in the room. My betrayer comes from within these walls. And once again, they're shocked. In fact, no disciple can fathom another disciple failing like that. So they all question themselves. Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And once Judas gets up and leaves, Jesus makes it very clear. Two things. Number one, he says, I'm going away. I'm not going to be with you anymore. I'm going away. And number two, then he says, I'm giving you a new command. And this new command is what permeates everything that night. It's what he needs to get out to his followers then. Here's a new command. You must love each other as I have loved you. And by the way, I just demonstrated to what extent you go to. You make yourself last in a room of people who don't deserve it, don't earn it. They're going to stab you in the back. One is going to go and literally betray you for money. Another one's going to come back and curse you three times by morning. You make yourself the lowest in every room. That's how you serve. That's how you love. Man, you're going to get the attention of people when you have title power position and you're the one that serves but the disciples don't get hung up on the new command they all go well, where are you going what do you mean you're going away can we come he goes don't worry about it you're not going to come now you'll come later well we'll go and then peter's like i'm willing to die for you he goes look guys it's not about where i'm going it's about this peter you're going to curse me three times before the rooster crows and that keeps peter quiet for the rest of the night now let's get back to this new command. Yes, you have a question. Where are you going? I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you will be also. In my father's house are many rooms. If this won't, sir, I wouldn't have told you. Now let's get back to the mission. Yes, you have a question. What is it? Can you show us how to get there? <laughs> Guys, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I've been teaching that for the last 15 chapters. Okay, back to this new command. Yes, you got a question. Can you just show us God? After I've been with you for three years, anyone who has seen me has seen God. See, the disciples, like us, we all get caught up and we're following you. What about heaven? What about heaven? And Jesus says, well, what about now? What about what you do now? <laughs> and they completely bypass this new command and they get caught up on where he's going and they want to know about heaven. And Jesus goes, look, here's the plan. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit is going to produce the type of love you need for each other in you and through you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Why would God love you and then go, hey, at the end, you'll see me in heaven. He wouldn't orphan you. He goes, it's my spirit that's going to be in you. By the way, when you start really serving and loving people as Christ did, he goes, be prepared. <laughs> the world may just hate you, but keep in mind that it hated me. And let me get back to something. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do is remain. Remain, 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 remain. And guess what's going to happen then? The Holy Spirit. 
It's going to change your life, and it's going to change the life of people around you. The Holy Spirit's going to convict people of sin. You don't go out and convict people of their sin. The Holy Spirit's going to bring people to understand, I need to change my life because I've seen the love you have. I've seen the way you live. I need to change my life. The Holy Spirit's going to convict people that Jesus was truly the Son of God. The Holy Spirit changes lives. He goes, that's the plan. So let's pray and let's get out of here. And and this is what we've been covering now for weeks. Jesus came into that night with one mission. And that one mission is to make sure that you and I know we have a mission. And that mission is going to be based on how we love each other. He goes, now the goal isn't just loving each other. A new command I give you, love each other as I have loved you so that all men and women will know that you are my disciples by the way you love each other. Your goal isn't just to love. Your goal is to show people Christ by how you love. And by the way, it's gonna be my spirit in you and through you. We've been hitting obedience. He goes, you remain in the spirit just by being obedient, by being obedient. And this is the entire upper room. He gives us the example of serving. He shows us one that doesn't wanna serve and he gets out because he wants a different plan than the God he has. He shows us that he's going away to get a place for us, but follow this command. The disciples get hung up on where he's going and Jesus keeps bringing it back to you. There's a Holy Spirit that's gonna be in you. Don't worry if you face persecution. By the way, most of your hard stand is probably gonna be persecuted by those in the church, not those outside the church. Look how the church treated Jesus. Shrug your shoulders and just keep loving people. And he says, then you're gonna remain, remain, remain. The Holy Spirit's gonna do the work in you and through you. Guys, let's pray. And we've watched this Lord's Prayer for the last two weeks. Damien started us off, man, can that kid teach? Woo, and the enthusiasm, are you kidding me? Man, if you thought that was amazing in the studio, you should see that guy on the stage. Our camera people have to follow him around like crazy, crazy. Man, I love that guy. Larry followed up last week with this incredible call to what does it look like to really follow? Mostly, mostly? (laughs) Or are we all in on this in serving and loving and walking in obedience and following Christ? And the dangers, the traps that we can fall into when we make it more about us. And then Jesus ends his prayer. His last words that night. I don't know if it ever dawned on you, but if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, do you realize that he specifically prayed for you around that table that night? We're in John chapter 17. It's the last words in the last supper the last night of Jesus' freedom. John chapter 17, verse 20. He prays for you. Catch this. Again, go to the back of the Bible, look for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 17, verse 20. Hey, online, by the way, thanks for joining us. Thanks for who you are and where you are and what you're doing. Prescott, thanks for sending me a shirt and thanks for telling me how to pronounce Prescott because you're not Prescott. Thanks for all of you that are watching, for clicking. Man, we encourage you, don't do this alone. Grab someone to share the truth, to share scripture with them. John 17, verse 20. So my prayer is not for them alone. Who's the them? He just got done praying for his disciples. My prayer is not just for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Did you catch that? Jesus, that last night goes, now I want to pray for all those who are going to believe in me through their message. What's their message? The gospel. Well, I know you're at home, you're watching, you're in groups around a table or a living room. Let me ask you something. How many of you now believe in Christ because of this message? He's praying for you. He goes, now I'm going to pray for everyone that comes to believe in me because of the message of the gospel, because of the message of the disciples are carrying out. And he prays for North Coast. And this is his prayer. That all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that, circle, highlight, underline, the world may believe that you have sent me. Now here's the final prayer of Jesus. I pray for North Coast Church that they will be complete unity. They will be one how much being one, just like I was in the Father and the Father was in me. Oh, that is oneness right there. In the exact same way, may this church be united and be one as believers so that the world's gonna realize that's different, so that the world's gonna realize that's gotta be Jesus, so that others will come to see a group of people truly living out Christianity and go, that's different, that's not natural. And if it's not natural, it must be 
supernatural. May the church have the type of unity that the world can only dream of. May the church have the type of unity and oneness that no one can else find in any club, in any event, in any niche, in any lifestyle, in any other community. May the church have something that's worth coming early and standing in line for just because just because I've never seen love or felt love like that before. Jesus goes, that's my prayer for the church. Watch how he doubles down on this, even triples down on this in verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. He doubles down it. God, may they be one so that the world will know that Christ was there and that Christ was real. Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. I love that phrase. Father, I want those that you have given me. So many times in Christianity, we think about what we've been given, the gift that we've been given in Jesus Christ. Do you realize we're the gift given back to Jesus? What did God give Jesus? Believers, his church, that's his body. Son, if you do this, son, if you walk in obedience all the way to obedience on the cross, son, even though you are the great beginning of John, that you are the word, the word was with God, the word was God in the very beginning, even though you created these people, if you give your life for these people, the gift that you're gonna have is you get these people. They get to be yours. Has it ever dawned on you that we are God's gift to Jesus? And you're like, well, Chris, that's probably why he wants us to get along. No, (laughs) I know any father wants us to get along, but he wants us to get along because that is the mission of attracting others. We are gonna be his tangible love on earth that draws others to him. That's the whole goal of unity. Watch how he proceeds with this. Verse 25, righteous father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove and he and his disciples went into it. And from next week on, we start the journey of the cross. And we're done with the upper room. And his very last words, he simply took time to pray for you. And there's no mystery in his prayer for us. You don't have to know Greek to understand his prayer for us. You don't have to go, well, in the original language, unity meant, nope. You don't have to sit down and go, man, he twists and turns a lot. I'm not quite, I couldn't follow his, nope. <laughs> he spends four paragraphs saying the exact same thing. God, I pray for every Christian that's gonna come later because of this message. And here's my prayer for the church. That they have unity, 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 and unity. And God, one more thing I ask. Can you make them one? <laughs> Give them unity. Unity. What, what kind of unity? The exact same unity Jesus had with the Father and the Father had with Jesus. Exact same unity. Why? Three times. So that the world may know that God sent Jesus. Wow. North Coast, this is one of the most timely messages, not just for our church, for the church in America today. For the church in America today. Because I, can I take you back to something that we, we filled in the blanks a couple of weeks ago on? There's two huge problems with Christianity. Two huge problems with Christianity. And you may say, Chris, I have a lot more problems than that with Christianity. Two huge problems with Christianity. Number one is how do you get in? Number one is what does it take to be a follower of Christ? And the unmistakable call to follow Jesus is to deny self, pick up a cross and follow him. That's the call of Jesus to the crowds. Here's the thing. You got to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. 
We've made Christianity today as, hey, if you just want to go to heaven and you want Jesus to bless your life, say a prayer. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know how that theology or philosophy came into the world, but we got people eating it up and calling it Christianity. No, Christianity is a call, the very essential first steps to deny who you are, to deny how you're born, to deny your desires, to deny your goals, to deny your wants, to deny your lust. It means you're gonna have to pick up a cross. That's gonna be a challenge. That's gonna be incredibly hard to do. And pick up a cross entails dying. You gotta die to those things. You have to die to self. And then you're gonna follow him. Then Jesus says there's an exchange program. Then he says, you're welcome to go on and live your life however you want and then try to find it. I tell you, in trying to find your life, you're gonna lose yourself. But I promise you this, anyone can walk this path and lose themselves, oh, they're gonna find themselves. You lose your life for me and my sake, he says. You're truly gonna gain it. See, the exchange is, you're gonna get a relationship with Christ. You're gonna get a relationship with the risen Lord. But people, this is unbelievable in the world today. For any American to tell any other American that you have to deny yourself, that is the ultimate hate speech. That is the ultimate sin or crime in the world today is to tell people they have to deny who they are, to deny how they feel, to deny how they were born, to deny their own natural attractions or lust or desires in all areas of life. You can't tell someone to deny themselves today. And yet it was the very unmistakable beginning of Jesus when he first started teaching the crowds and they came to him. He said to everyone, this is open to anyone. Here's what it looks like. You've got to die to yourself, surrender. And then I give you this. And I'm going to admit first and foremost, this is a bigger cross for some today than others. Yes, we're all born sinners. We all need to be born again. It doesn't matter how we're born or how we're made or our upbringing. We all need to come to Christ and have the old things passed away and all things become new. But for a lot of us, I'll admit for me, that wasn't much of a cross. I had lived Chris's existence. I had lived Chris's life. I was done with Chris. I was ready for an exchange. And the exchange meant I could live a better life. See, to exchange my sexuality the way I was doing it for Christ meant I could have a beautiful, gorgeous woman like Amy inside and out. And then and, and this woman is beautiful inside and out can be my bride for the rest of my life. And there I can experience enjoyment, fulfillment with her. Sign me up. How did I not come to this sooner? <laughs> But for a lot of our brothers and sisters and those that are in church today go, well, what's that mean for me? Hmm. I've, I've said to this church over and over again, I will gladly change my theology as soon as God changes his word. But as long as the word of God is the word of God, I must live by it, even the pages I disagree with, even the pages that seem unfair, even the pages that seem like they may be hate speech, even the pages that seem like that's not fair to that individual. How come them and how come? And I go, I get it, I get it. So what do you get in return? If I'm asking people to surrender to the word of God, not just to get a savior, we all want a savior, but to truly get a Lord, What do you get in return? He goes, Chris, you're, you're going to get a life with me, a joy, a peace, and contentment that you can't get on your own. Remember when he told the disciples, peace I give you. Oh, not the world's peace. Not peace because things are going well or you're having a good day. He goes, my shalom I give you. My peace I give you. A peace where you can learn not just to like yourself, but love yourself and who you are and what God's calling you to be. But it's, it's a surrendered life. And he goes, and secondly, they're going to get a community that loves them unconditionally. And that's what the upper room was about. You know what you're going to offer people when they have to walk away from a lifestyle? You're going to offer them you. And look at the community. Who wouldn't want to be part of that? which brings those of us that are in the kingdom of God to the second huge problem. That is, once we become a Christian, we don't get to choose who we love, how we love, or when we love. We just don't. Once we become a Christian, we don't get to choose who we love, how we love, or when we love. Chris, didn't we cover that a couple weeks ago? Aren't these the exact same film? Oh, they are. They are. <laughs> Why? Because when we unpack the upper room, 
That's all Jesus was about from beginning to end. Let me show you how to make yourself 13 in a room. Let me show you how to love others. Let me command you to love others as I've loved you. And let me give you the Holy Spirit that's gonna produce that love in you and through you. That's how the whole thing works. Yeah, yeah, I know you guys got caught up in heaven because I'm going away. That wasn't the plan, but I'll discuss heaven enough with you just to get you off that track and get you back here on earth. So many Christians, we wanna say our prayer and just know we get heaven and we're gonna live a great life until we get there. And we forget the entire upper room. The mission was, no, the mission is this. You can choose whether or not you wanna be a Christian. You can't choose the type of Christianity that you get. We don't get to decide what Christianity is. We don't get to decide who we love, how we love, or when we love. And in fact, this is so important to Jesus. His last words in the upper room was for the church to come, North Coast Church. I love giving this message to a church that gets this. I love giving this message to a church that goes to the community before the community comes to them. I love giving this message to a church that goes, that's what we're about, that's why we're here. But I know there's still a lot of us that wrestle with, how do we do this? <laughs> how do we put this in motion? It's not loving God that sets us apart. It's not loving the Bible. It's not us loving church. It's not us loving worship. It's not us loving Jesus that he's commanding us to do. The last night in the upper room, Jesus didn't say, I need you to love church. I need you to love life group. I need you to love worship. I need you to love going to church on the weekends. No, he said, I need you to love each other as I loved you. He goes, that's gonna be your walk of faith. That's gonna be what sets you apart. And the rest of the New Testament, they're just trying to break down. What's that look like? What's that look like? In fact, it's why we have so many books in the New Testament after the life of Jesus, because they're all trying to sort out to the churches that they planted with, oh my gosh, a lot of people came to know the love of Jesus and they're in. Now what are they into? They're into a bunch of ex-sinners, broken people trying to get along. Oh, the church has just become a nut house, and it's crazy. Take 1 Corinthians, for example. 1 Corinthians is this jacked up city. Rig, do you got that for me? Watch this. So this is the Mediterranean Sea. This purple is basically the Roman Empire at its height and in the first century. And right here in Greece, you have this little city called Corinth. You see where it's located? Now, if you could zoom in, I'm not zooming in, I want you to get the whole picture. You're gonna see that water flows all from here and all the way from here, and right in the middle, you have Corinth. And let me tell you why Corinth is situated right in the heart of the Roman Empire, beautifully for disaster. <laughs> because all shipping in the Mediterranean from Rome and all shipping is gonna come through this port and everything to what they would call Asia, now modern day Turkey and Israel would all come up through this port. It's dangerous to sail in first century ships around the horn with all these rocks in the open water. But because Corinth is situated on this little isthmus, the largest city in Greece, ships could come in one side, unload, offload, a ship's on the other side, take it, or they actually dug out a little canal and little roller system where they would bring ships up, move them across and put them back in, which makes Corinth a beautiful spot for anonymity, for being away from home, for merchants, for sailors, for businessmen and women, for those that are on long journeys just to camp out for a while. And this little place, Corinth, just became a cesspool of morality. It's a place where you come into Corinth, there's huge billboards that says what's done in Corinth stays in Corinth and everything can be bought and everything can be sold and it's crazy. And the apostle Paul spends a year and a half in that city. You can read about it in Acts chapter 18 and so many different walks of life come to a point of saying, I'm done, I want to exchange. And Paul goes, listen, you gotta lay down your life. You're gonna have to pick up a whole new life. This isn't a God that's gonna bless your life or your lifestyle. Huh. It's you coming to a whole new point of dying to yourself and picking up a new life. And for some of you, that's gonna be harder than others. And people said, but look where this life has gotten me so far. I'm in. So after a year and a half of Paul building this church in Corinth, he leaves. And Paul's not gone for more than just a few months and he starts getting the reports. Man, that church is splitting up into all kinds of different groups. I mean, you can see it. Look at the type of people that this church was built on. I mean, they've got absolutely nothing in common. And the moment Paul left, the order left with them, and everyone starts splitting up in divisions and factions. 
And so 1 Corinthians is just Paul writing, trying to solve all the divisions in the church. Chapters one through four, the Corinthians are arguing about how they came to Christ and who's a better Bible teacher. They're arguing about Paul or Apollos or Peter. And I got saved by this guy, but this guy says, and this guy, and Paul has to spend a few chapters going, why is there so much division in your church? You are there because of one Jesus, one common love, one salvation. That's what you center yourself around. In chapters five through seven, he has to straighten out sexuality in this church. He has to openly write to one guy, you gotta stop sleeping with your stepmom. And he told the others in the church and stop applauding that. He told the others in the church, you gotta stop going to the prostitutes in the city. And the church is actually taking notes on this. Check, no sleeping with stepmom, no more prostitutes. What else you got for me? And Paul has to write a letter going, do you know the division this is creating in the church? Don't you know that your body is a temple of God? That that temple of God passage is written purely for our sexuality. Whatever you are doing sexually with your body, you are taking Christ in and out of that action and transaction with you. Have you ever thought about it that way? And he has to straighten out the division when it comes to sexual integrity and immorality and says your sexual morality is key to your response to God's grace and mercy. That's what probably needs to be surrendered more than anything else. In chapters eight through 10, he has to write because they're divided about whether they can eat ribeye or not. And you're like, who fights over ribeye? Well, there were vegans and there were carnivores. No, the problem was a lot of meat was being sacrificed to a lot of idols and a lot of temples, a lot of gods and goddesses in that city. And meat that sacrificed burned on an altar somewhere is cheaper meat than going to the butcher and getting meat that hasn't been touched or used. So I'm going downtown and I'm getting the cheaper ribeye and coming back. But I'm having dinner and some of the Jews that now know Christ around my table, they're not gonna eat because it was sacrificed to an idol. And Paul has to write about divisions going, idols are just made of wood and stone. There's nothing to them, folks. If you can get cheaper ribeye in this day and age, get cheaper ribeye. However, if you've got new Christians and they won't come to your table because of where you bought the ribeye, then don't serve that ribeye when they come over. And he brings them back to love. He brings them back to you have one common thing together the love of Christ, and because of that, you are gonna love each other. In chapters 11 through 14, he says your church gatherings are, are becoming useless. They're causing more harm than good. You're arguing, dividing, even about spiritual things and spirituality. And then in chapter 15, he closes saying, you're arguing about whether or not the Jesus raised from the dead and whether or not we're gonna rise from the dead. He goes, don't you know that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all this is useless? He's just another mere mortal. It is 15 chapters of a church divided. And in the heart of it, where we go today to end our time, is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you got a Bible, leave John 17, turn to the right. John to the right, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul has to write back to the city right here and tell them, because you are a mix of all these people, and all these races, and all these ethnicities, and all these lifestyles. Let me give you a picture. And all he's trying to do is hammer out everything Jesus prayed for North Coast in the upper room. And in 1 Corinthians, oh gosh, we gotta start in verse 11, or chapter 11, 17. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. He goes, in the following directives, what I'm about to write, I have no praise for you, for your meetings are doing more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there has to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Oh, his sarcasm is coming in thick and deep. Oh, I hear you got all kinds of divisions in the church. I'm not surprised. There has to be divisions to show which of you are closer to God. Yeah, they're picking up the sarcasm. Paul's pen is lightning fast on this time. He starts talking about the Lord's Supper, about the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and the cup, the thing that we call communion that we celebrate in our life groups, that we celebrate in homes here at North Coast. He's all, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Paul loves that people are coming to know Christ. What Paul hates is the church forgot what the last supper and the last commands of Jesus were all about, that we are gonna be united. Not because we have everything in common, but simply because we have Christ in common, so everything else isn't gonna matter anymore. And the church needs a picture to hold on to. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, he gives them the picture. Just as a body, 
though is one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Guys, just like your body has many parts, it is one part, it is one function, and that is the church. Whether you're a Jew or Gentile, slave or free, I don't care where you come from, the moment you come to one Holy Spirit, one love, we become one. Now, if the foot should say, well, I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if an ear should say, well, I'm not an eye. I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, get ready, circle, highlight, underline, just as he wanted them to be. Why do we have so many weird, jacked up people in the church? Not you, of course, not me, but you know others. Why do we have so many weird and jacked up people in the church? Because God has brought them just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, one part body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, well, then I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Oh, Paul is on fire right now. He goes, look, I'll play your game. I know we live in a day and age where we love separating and dividing the church over how we think, how we act, how we see things, how we vote, how we believe, how we see culture, how we see cultural issues. He goes, so you think there are some Christians that are weaker because of that? He goes, I'll play your terminology. So those that we think are weaker, then you make them indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, don't you realize there's less honorable Christians today? You know, those people that do, those people that think, those people that act, those people that believe. <laughs> he goes, oh, you think there's less honorable Christians? Then you treat them with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, because don't you think there's unpresentable people? Well, there's Christians, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't ever want to hear from them. We wouldn't want to put them up. We wouldn't want, I mean, they're Christians, but you know, they must be very immature or very new there. He goes, oh, you think there's parts that are unpresentable? You treat them with special modesty. Man, you make sure they are covered more than anyone. Well, our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that, there should be no division in the body of Christ, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. This is the church. Where's Paul get that? The last night of Jesus' freedom in the upper room, his very last words before he went to the cross, he prayed for North Coast Church. Father, I pray that they may become one. What type of one? Just as I was in you and you were in me, they may be in us and may they be one completely united together so that the world will know Jesus Christ must exist. And then he doubled down on it. Father, may you give them the glory, the same glory that you gave me that I was in you. So may they be in us and may they love each other so that the world will know that you have sent me. God, would you bring them to complete unity and I will continue to reveal you to them. It's the very last prayer. And Paul takes up a picture of a body and says, here we go. It's no coincidence that chapter 13 follows chapter 12, of course, but Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. We know the numbers were added hundreds of years later. Paul goes into, let me tell you what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It delights. It doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Oh, we love reading that at weddings. 1 Corinthians 13 is the premier wedding passage. That was not meant for a husband and wife. That was not meant for romance. I'm okay if you have it at your wedding. It's great. It's a definition of love. But Paul wrote it to show the church this is how you deal with everyone that comes in and out of your parking lot, in and out of your doorway. Th this is love. By the way, where do I get that from? It's the way Christ loved us. Wow. <laughs> let's, let's bring this home. Let's close the door in the upper room. See, our Christianity must be defined by both our belief and our behavior. 
Our Christianity has to be both our belief and our behavior. And if we reduce our Christianity to simply belief, we are in grave danger. Or as the Bible would say, you should really look at, are you a Christian? If this belief hasn't changed your heart and soul and your actions, if this belief hasn't changed your behavior, oh, I think we're in grave danger. In that upper room, Jesus never pushed what you know, what you know, what you know, what is true, what is true, what is true. He pushed behavior. May my love transform you in such a way where now you love everyone. Why? Because you've experienced how I love you. Go to the same. Go to the same. Remember when Christ loved me before I loved him. Christ loved me when my lifestyle was a mockery to him. Christ loved me when I had no desire for him. Christ loved me when I didn't think his way. I didn't pray his way. I didn't live his way. That's when Christ loved me. He goes, go to the same. But Chris, people make it real different. There's some people that I just have a lot of anger and hatred for. You're okay to hate people. Just write down the people that Jesus hated. And then you hate those type of people. And you're not going to find it. If we're loved the way Christ loved us, we're not going to find an excuse for hating people. We just aren't. We live in a culture where we like to demonize people. And when we demonize people, we will never be able to disciple them. And we live in a culture where we love to divide the church. We do the opposite of what Paul is instructing. We live in a day and age where it is it's just applauded that people leave a church and all get together with people that believe the exact same way, think the exact same way, vote the exact same way, see culture the exact same way, see issues the exact same way. So we got a church of nothing but eyeballs. Why? Because they see things the same way. And of course, the eyeball church thinks they're right. Why? Because we see things the right way. And we're not going to associate with, with the stinky part of the church, like the feet. There's a church down the road that's nothing but feet, and they're the stinky part of the body. But those feet go, well, at least we're out doing something. We're out moving. You eyeballs are sitting there just glaring at the world. We're doing something. And the feet go, man, we'd rather be feet. At least we're marching orders. At least we're bringing love somewhere. And then there's a church across the street that's nothing but ears because they hear everything the same way. They process everything the same way. They believe all the same way. And so people have left churches to find other eyeballs, other ears, other feet. And that's why the world's not lining up at our door. Because the world understands division and the church is great at it. And there's no love for Christ and division. There's nothing that makes the world and culture look at us and go, man, how do I get what they have? No, Christians are just a bunch of fighters who divide people. That's the world. That's the world. No one's going to line up and buy a ticket to be like you. And that's why our church always has been. That's why we're going to continue to be a place that never changes our theology. But we change our behavior to match Christ and go, Christ, how can we outlove him? Christ, how can we do this the right way? Christ, how can your life be in me and through me? Not just my belief, but my behavior. It's why James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, what good is saying you have belief without actions? That's dead. You do know the demons believe in Jesus. You do know the demons believe in God as creator. You do know the demons know Jesus is the son of God. You do know that demons believe Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, and rose again for the sins of everyone. The demons believe that. They experienced it. They're not Christ followers. What's the difference between your belief and demon belief? Behavior. My life is surrendered to him as Lord, not just a savior, surrendered to him as Lord. And our belief and our behavior have to go hand in hand. You see, if we have divisions within the church, our problem is with God, not people. If we create these divisions within the church, our problem is with God, not people. Our problem isn't with people that don't see things the right way, other Christians that don't believe, other Christians that are too immature, other Christians that don't base it on theology, other Christians. My problem isn't with people. My problem is with God. Two counts. Number one, I'm not following his greatest command regardless of what any other Christian believes. My command is still to love them. Still to love them. And secondly, Paul just wrote, God has placed them in the body exactly as he wanted them to be. That doesn't mean we all come to Christ and stay our same way. We're all on a projection of lordship and surrender and obedience. He goes, but there's a lot of people that think and look at the world differently than you. And you know what? God loved them and God drew them in. So if you got a problem with them being in the church, your problem's with God, not with people. And I love the way Paul lays that out in his illustration of the body. So then he says, well, then we sacrifice all of ourselves in order for others to see Christ's sacrifice for them. And he goes, and now you're in the program.
we sacrifice all of ourselves in how I love and how I serve others. It's going to be a sacrifice. Why? In order for others to see Christ's sacrifice for them. I, I wrote it down this way. It's kind of wordy. But the goal of Jesus' command is the presence of his love on earth. What does Jesus want from the upper room? He wants his love to be clearly seen on earth. A new command I give you. Why? So you're known as loving people? Nope. So that everyone will know that you are my disciple. He closes the prayer with what? Unity, unity, unity within your church. Why? So that, so that, so that they may know that I was sent. <laughs> the purpose of this is to bring Christ's love on earth. This will be our mission of attraction when the world pursues all of its hopes and dreams and is left without a true, fulfilling love. They can see his because they've seen the church. <laughs> a great theologian, Don Carson's wrote it this way. Don Carson said, Jesus was clear. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you can love one another. You see, how we treat, how we talk about, how we respond to and care for one another is the identifying mark of a genuine Christ follower. It's not what we believe. Nobody knows, nobody cares, and nobody is better off because of what we believe. It's how we live that out that impacts lives. I suspect that one of the reasons why there are so many commands in the New Testament for Christians to love other Christians is because this is not an easy thing to do. And then get this, ideally, the church itself is not made up of natural friends. It is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together as a church is not our common education. It's not our common race. It's not our common income level. It's not our common politics. It's not our common nationality. It's not our common accents. It's not our common jobs or anything else that is common. Christians come together, not because they form a natural collection, but because they have all been saved by Jesus Christ and we owe him our common allegiance. In the light of this common allegiance, in the light of the fact that we have all been loved by Jesus himself, we commit ourselves to doing what he says and he commands us to love one another. In this light, we are a band of natural enemies who love one another for the sake of Jesus as Jesus loved us, Don Carson's. Isn't that good? In your life groups, man, let's watch using common language that says what well, we all know, what well, we all believe, what well, we all think, what well, we all feel on cultural divisive issues where my bet is we don't all feel, we don't all think, we don't all know. I, I know because of your news station and your social media and your intelligence, you have the one truth in our culture today. But we have to be open that there's other people that are believers on this journey that have a different truth. And when we start using a language that is inclusive and excluding others, I promise you, we slowly want to become groups where we all are just the same eyes. I love our life group because we all see things the same way. Oh, may we never have a life group of just eyes or just ears or just feet. Man, we need each other. When you come to church, may you realize if you're not bringing someone Somebody else probably is. And somebody has been working on a friend or neighbor for a couple years, knowing that if they come, they may have to deny themselves or how they're born or how they're made or what they want to do or how they're living or who they're living with right now. And the call for them to deny that is going to be a huge cross to pick up. And we all know the love of Christ we get in return, but they don't know yet. So when you show up, from the moment you park your car and walk in the door and sit where you sit, when you show up, may you look around and go, who's by themselves? Who needs to be loved? Who needs to be greeted? I don't care if you got a badge on or a shirt. We expect those people to greet us. But if some North Coaster invited them, how can I be part of the body that just loves them? Loves them. Because they may be faced with giving up something that's going to be huge. And in return they're going to see the church and go, that's not natural. That's supernatural. The way they love, the way they have open arms, the way they accept. And if Christ is bringing people to him, God forbid we make it hard 
because we think they are them, those. When we are all them and those, we are all wretched sinners that God loved before we loved him. And we are all people that had to come through a transformation too. Oh, North Coast, like I said, I love delivering this message to a group that gets it. My heart still breaks when I have people say, I don't think I can mention who I vote for in my life group. They've made it very clear. <laughs> Christians only think one way, believe one way. Or the parents have said, I don't think I can talk about what my son or daughter is going through. Because I think my circle has made it very clear what they think about them or those people. Oh, may we watch our language. May our heart break for the things that breaks Christ's heart. And may we come back to the only thing you know Jesus ever prayed about you. May we have unity, unity, and unity. May we love unconditionally those that are in the church. Because they may be having to walk through hell to get heaven. It's the two tensions in the church today. We have to hold on to the call of what does it look like to surrender all of our lives for lordship, not just to get a savior, but to be lord. And we can't fall into the divisiveness that says our church will only line up behind this flag, this person, this way of life, this culture, this view. Because God needs that love to be the reason people can come and surrender. And that's where we find church. And it's going to get muddy and ugly and raw. And it should. Otherwise, we're the wrong type of church. Wow, North Coast, you're doing this in amazing ways. May all of us look around and say, where do I play my part? Please don't come to church and say, I love everyone. Please come to church and find someone to love. Someone, not everyone. Someone. And let's all be part of the eyes, ears, hands, feet of this body of Christ so he can continue to do amazing work. We've been talking about this so much in this upper room, I hate to let it go. And yet Amber Hoffland is one of our amazing people. She grew up here at North Coast. She's on our life group team. She was part of our life group team. Now she's over communications for the Vista campus. So she makes sure everything is spelled the right way. All everything that goes in and out is checked the right way because you don't want my spelling anywhere on the screen. She does an amazing job for us. And she sits in sermon prep every Tuesday where whoever's teaching goes over their message and there's a group of 20, 25 staff that come in and out and just, just kind of just mull this over so the message doesn't come from any one of us, but it's truly a group activity. And a couple sermon preps ago, I got a little text from her and said, hey, after sermon prep, I wrote this. I don't know if you wanted to hear it or not, but this is kind of how I process. And she had recorded a little song on her guitar. And for whatever reason that night, when I got to that text, it's what I needed. And I listened to that song and I cried. I'm man enough to admit it. I sat on my couch and I cried. And I said, Amber, would you mind closing us in prayer today? But here's what I'm gonna ask. Can you close us in prayer with your song? Because your song is our prayer from this upper room. This is our church's prayer because of how Jesus prayed for our church. So I'm gonna clear this stuff out of here. Amber is gonna come. And she's going to close us in a song that she wrote after sermon prep as our prayer today. I know you're going to enjoy it. I hope you can apply this. Here we go. Let them know you by our love. Let them know you by our joy. Let them know you by our peace that passes understanding. Let them know you by the way we choose to remain and abide in the vine that holds the branches and when the world is hurting and people are broken let our love be the door that lets the hope in and when we see the wounds and the pain in front of us lord let it be true that the healing starts with us Let us love one another like you loved us first. Let us move together as you build your church. Let us be the body that you died to raise. 
let the greatest command be our highest praise they will know you they will know you they will know you by our love they will know you they will know you they will know you by our Let them know you by our patience and the way that we respond. May every word be dripping with grace like honey. Let them know you by our restraint when they try to place the blame. And they're looking for evidence, may they find nothing. Let us love one another like you loved us first. Let us move together as you built your church. Let us be the body that you died to raise. Let the greatest command be our highest praise. They will know you. They will know you. They will know you by our they will know you, they will know you, they will know you by our love. Not by our knowledge or even the truth, but by our love they'll know you. Not by our logic or the things that it proves, just by our love they'll know you. So let us love one another like you loved us first. Let us move together as you built your church. Let us be the body that you died to raise. Let the greatest command be our highest praise. They will know you. They will know you. They will know you. By our love, they will know you, they will know you, they will know you by our love. Lord, let it be true that when this world sees your church, sees your people when they see us, they would find the most loving people they've ever met. And would they go, I don't know how they do it, but somehow. They manage to love each other, and somehow they love me. And would our love be your heart on display to a hurting world? And would that be the highest praise to your ears? And all God's people said, amen. What an incredible message and a beautiful song. What a reminder to, for us to simply remain. Amber, one of our very own staff members, wrote that. And if you'd like to be able to listen to it again or share it with a friend, you can simply go to our social media account, North Coast Online, and we will give you a resource to be able to do that. Well, that reminder for us being connected to the vine, that's our source of life. And we'll be in prayer for you if you can be in prayer for us. And we together can pray for Israel and everything that's going on. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week.